أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا All praise, all thanks, all gratitude belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, We thank him, we praise him and we send our prayers, our blessings um, and our peace on our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Assalamu uh, alaikum, so happy to be here again to share with you some reflections on this beautiful Jum'ah, this blessed Jum'ah um, what I had in store for today was a bit of an extension of what I spoke on last time. And um, the last time that I was with Muslim Space, I spoke on uh, the obstacle of religious guilt. And I particularly spoke of um, uh, a particular definition of it. So I'll first quickly kind of review what I spoke on and then uh, continue on from there. So last time what we essentially discussed uh, was that... Um, the way that religious guilt um, can be an obstruction to true repentance is that uh, is if we consider religious guilt as a magnification of our own feelings of unworthiness and of shame, and that we they become so big before our heart's eye that it becomes difficult then to actually turn to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala as Toba has it. It means to turn. So um, that essentially was the gist of what I covered last time. Um, today, what I really want to focus on is that if, you know, our feelings of shame, low self-worth um, and unworthiness can get in the way of us actually wholeheartedly turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what, and, and if this uh, process of simply brooding over our lowliness or or the fact that we're just too ugly to receive the mercy of Allah, too terrible um, to receive the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, if, if this is an issue, then what is Toba within our tradition? What is Toba within our tradition? Or what is the right way, or maybe not the right way, but the, 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 the sound disposition of Toba? What does it look like? Um, that's what I hope to share with you this Friday, is to kind of describe to you the process of Toba within our tradition by sharing some reflections on a particular verse uh, in the Quran, as well as by um, um, giving you some commentary on that verse, which will go into a story um, from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu um, So let me start actually with that verse uh, from the Quran itself. So, قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي كِتَابِهِ الْمَجِيدِ بَعْدَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ God says in his noble book, وَعَلَى السَّلَاسَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُوبَتْ وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَظَنُّوا أَلَّا مَلْجَأَ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ so to tra translate this, um, we read in Surah at verse 118, that, um, and upon the three, so we're talking about the particular people from the time of the Prophet, and upon the three uh, whose matter was deferred until the earth became constricted for them despite all its vastness, and even their souls were constricted for them, and they realize that there is no refuge, there is no escape from God, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except to Him, except back to Him. Then He turned towards them, as in then God turned towards them, so that they may turn, so that they may turn. Surely God is off turning, ever merciful. Surely God is off turning, ever merciful. So, in translating this to you, uh, I want to focus on uh, one part of this to really drill home uh, or to really drill home what this process looks like. What you'll notice is that in the course of these verses, and we'll go into sort of who these three people were from the time of the Prophet them, but you'll notice that there are three people that are being mentioned, their matter is being deferred, and there are feelings of just constriction and difficulty that they're feeling. Um, they feel like uh, the earth is small, even though it's vast, th their soul is uh, constricted. And they come to the realization that 
you know, there is no place of escape out of these feelings except uh, to turn back to God. Once it's, it appears as though once they've uh, sort of realized this, then it says, then God turned to them, liyatubu, so that they could turn, so that they could turn. Um, and what, what's interesting here, and inshallah we'll come back to, is that God's turning to them precedes their turning to Him. And there's a kind of mutuality in this process of tawbah that this verse points points out for us. Um, and just to read it again for uh, emphasis, ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ لِيَتُوبُ Right? So, ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ The word here, taba is the turning. So then, he turned to them, liyatubu, so they would also turn. So there's this mutual turning. God is turning to them so that they can turn to God, you know? And it's almost as though God's turning to them with His mercy is what allows them to turn to, to Him. Um, but this mutuality is what I kind of want to lift up as we go into some of the um, uh, explanation for this verse. Um, that uh, goes into the story behind these particular three people. Uh, so let me actually share with you uh, parts of this story. And I apologize ahead of time because this will be a little bit of me reading, but I will try to um, comment on it and keep it lively, inshallah. Um, so this particular verse is talking about three individuals from the time of the Prophet wasallam, three companions, who had ended up um, not participating in the Battle of Tabuk. And um, there was no good excuse for why they did not, because the Prophet um, had asked all the Muslims to, that were able-bodied to, to, to go on this um, expedition. They, however, did not go. And so this particular, there's a narration that sort of um, is attached to these verses in a, in a tafsir that I was reviewing. And it is a long narration by the companion um, Kaab ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, may God be pleased with him, um, who kind of goes through his whole internal process recounting what these verses were talking about. You know, and it's a beautiful depiction of his process of tawbah and turning. Um, and I'll do my best to, as I said, keep it lively, but it is a rather lengthy narration and I will be reading. Um, so... What's said is that uh, I'm going to go in and out from his words to my commentary. So he starts off saying, as for the background of my absence from the battle of Tabuk, the truth is that I had never been so rich. I had never been so rich as I was at that time. By God, I never had two mounts before that, which I then had. So he's alluding to the fact that he was doing OK. He, he, he in terms of his wealth, uh, he had what he needed to, to perform um, uh, perform jihad to perform um, this uh, struggle, you know, uh, in the way of God, um, this physical warfare in, in terms of uh, struggle. Um, and then the Holy Prophet وسلم, uh, he says, was ready to carry out his plan for the jihad. He says the heat was intense, the Muslim forces were on short supplies, the journey was long, um, and then they were going to fight, as in they, the Muslims, were going to fight a stronger enemy. Um, so he's sort of depicting for us that this was no easy ask per se. You know, this was um, a heavy demand for the Muslims um, at this time to go out. Um, but the Prophet Wasallam made this call for jihad openly and publicly so that Muslims could make all necessary preparations for it in advance. Um, he also notes that there was no muster roll of those who set out for this expedition um, put in writing. Right, so there was no record of who was going to be going, and therefore those who did wish not to go, um, they had an opportunity on hand. You know, since the names were not being recorded, they could kind of sit back and not go if they really didn't want to. And this is sort of what happens for um, um, th three companions. One of them, Sayyidina Ka'ab ibn Malik, and also there were those that were considered uh, in the community to be hypocrites. They weren't truly um, accepting of the message of Islam or the message of the Prophet inwardly. Um, so he, he goes on, he says, as for myself, I went out every morning to prepare, but came back without having done it. My heart said, I'm capable of jihad, I must go. But days passed and my intention kept being put off until a tomorrow. So he has this sense of procrastination that he's trying to share with us. 
He says, until the day came where the Prophet and the majority of Muslims departed for jihad. Still then my heart kept urging me to leave and join up somewhere en route. Alas, only if I were to do that. But unfortunately, this couldn't be done. So he's saying that day after day, he kept saying to himself that, you know, there's no good reason why I can't go on this expedition. Um, uh, or sorry, he, he starts off saying there wasn't any good good reason why I, I didn't go. The truth is that I made an intention that, okay, I'll get ready. Okay, I'll get ready. But it kept getting postponed until one day the prophet left uh, and I wasn't able to catch up with him. And he says that, uh, after after they left, he said wherever he would go in Medina, where, wherever he would look, he would start to feel a certain sadness. Because the only thing he would see were people who were either sunk in hypocrisy, meaning they weren't really down for the cause of the Prophet, that's why they didn't go. Or people that were sick and crippled, seriously uh, unable, uh, physically uh, unable to join. Um, he says, and on the other hand, the Prophet وسلم, while he's feeling this grief, didn't actually bring up, uh, you know, where is Kaab until they actually reached Tabuk. And then the Prophet asked, what happened to Kaab ibn Malik? You know, and so when he's at, when the Prophet asked this, um, one, one, one of the men that are present says, Ya Rasulullah, he's been detained by his nice dress and his looking towards his shoulders in ad self-admiration. So one person basically kind of uh, puts him down in a sense and another companion kind of comes to the rescue and he says, what you've said is, isn't right. And he turns to the Prophet Sallallahu and he says, Ya Rasulullah, by God, we know nothing about Sayyidina Ka'ab, uh, the companion, except that which is good. And thereupon the Prophet Sallallahu falls silent. He falls silent. He doesn't say anything. Um, then we get to the scene essentially where the Prophet Sallallahu has returned. Um, and here's some of the commentary of what this companion is feeling. He says, I was concerned, almost close to concocting in a hurry some excuse for my absence and presenting things through which I could have escaped facing the displeasure of the Prophet ﷺ. Maybe I could have asked my family and friends also to help me out of this predicament. Um, he's like, worries like this kept, you know, sort of destabilizing my heart until I heard the Prophet ﷺ had finally come. Then he said all these confusing thoughts sort of dissipated for me and I was like, ugh, man, there's only one way out of this. I have to be honest. I have to be straightforward with the Prophet. So that's, that's the only way out of this situation. Um, so I want to skip down now to the fact that um, the confrontation with the Prophet Now he knows he's kind of done something that he doesn't have a good excuse for. He knows that the Prophet may be upset with him. He didn't want to face that. Um, but now he's sort of um, uh, resolved to do so. Right before this, some context setting is that there were others that didn't go uh, on this expedition for you know disingenuous reasons, and they sort of go the path of uh, outwardly saying that, oh yeah, we we had um, they gave false excuses essentially to the prophet, and the prophet sallam accepts these based on the what they presented to him. You know, he doesn't argue with them, and he simply got, uh, prays that God forgives them. Um, um, so, unlike these folks that are sort of disingenuous and just kind of putting up false excuses and not really re revealing what's really in their hearts, um, this companion decides that he has to say the truth to the prophet. So <clears throat> here's that quick anecdote. It, says, it was under this situation that I presented myself before him. When I offered my salam to him, he smiled, smiling like someone angry, smiling like someone angry. I thought this was interesting how attentive the people around the Prophet are to his every reaction. You know, they're really reading into him. Um, then he said, come, meaning the Prophet said, come. So I walked towards him until I sat down before him. According to some reports, the Prophet turned his face away from him. Thereupon Sayyidina Ka'ab said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of God, why would you turn your face away from me? I have nothing to do with hypocrisy, nor have I ever suffered from any doubt, nor am I guilty of making any alterations to this to the religion. Um, then the Prophet Wasallam said, Why then didn't you go? Why then why didn't you go for jihad? Is it not that you had already bought a mount for this purpose? You had what you needed. He said, uh, I said, as in Sayyidina Kaab said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah, if I would have been sitting before anyone 
among worldly people besides anyone in this world besides you, I'm confident I would have invented some excuse and avoided that person's displeasure. Because uh, I'm good at speaking. I'm good at, I'm good at debate. Um, um, but I swear by God that I've understood that if I tell you a lie, um, even if it pleases you temporarily, the day won't be far when God tells you the whole truth of the situation and will make you displeased with me. So either way, you know, you're going to be unhappy, whether I tell you now or you find out through God. So he says, but if I were to tell you the truth, which may displease you in this moment, what I hope is that God will forgive me. Um, and he just says, the truth of the matter is I had no real excuse for not being there. Um, I had never been stronger, both financially and physically, as I was at that time. So when he hears this, the Prophet ﷺ just announces, and there were others gathered around the Prophet. He says, this man has told the truth. Then he said, all right, go until God gives his decree in your case. So he's kind of saying, we're going to turn your matter to God. So he leaves, essentially. Um, this part I'm going to skip a bit, uh, but essentially it sort. this part of the narrative shows how he leaves this gathering. The prophet has kind of said, okay, you've told me the truth, now go. And on his way, some of the people come to him and sort of tempt him by saying, why didn't you just offer a false excuse like the others did? You know, um, God, uh, the prophet would have asked for forgiveness for you and that dua would have been enough to cover your, your sins. And you've never sinned before this. Um, he's like, I almost felt tempted, but then I was like, no, nah, I can't add another sin to this one. And, and uh, he ends up going home. And then he also learns that there were two other companions who similarly did not go on this uh, expedition who had done the same thing as him as in they had come clean with the Prophet ﷺ. And their excuses is interesting just to kind of note these everyday excuses, you know, uh, and what it would have meant to be in front of the Prophet. And he's making this heavy demands of the community to actually participate in the physical defense of the community and what that, the toll that it takes. I just want you all to kind of hear some of the reasoning. So for, for Sayyidina Kaab, we know it was just procrastination. It was uh, a sense of like putting it off, not really getting on top of it until the day comes and, and the caravan is left. But for the other two companions, um, it says that um, the first person, which was Murara, uh, another companion, was left behind is that he had a date farm where the fruit was ripening. And he said to himself, uh, he says to himself, you've taken part in many battles before this. If you don't go for this jihad this year, how would that become a crime? He's like, what's the big deal? Like, you've, you've already served the community so much. Um, it Later, when he was sort of alerted to the fact that, nah, this wasn't really the right way to think about it, um, he had sort of resolved to give this date palm tree um, in Sadaqah. As for the other one, whose name was Sayyidina Hilal radiallahu anhu, his family, uh, he, he, his situation was, was that his family had been scattered for a long time um, and they had sort of all assembled together finally. So it's kind of like a family reunion. And he thought of not going to jihad that year and spending some time with his family. He just wanted to spend some time with his family. And he too was then reminded of the gravity of the situation because when you're sort of before or in the presence of the Prophet of God, uh, what 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 would that even mean for us? You know, if we were present at that time and the sacrifices we were being called to make, um, these could look like everyday things for us. You know, we're many centuries removed from that situation, um, but you know, even now we could take lessons from these sort of uh, our intentions getting sidelined when we have noble intentions or when we clearly know we are called to do something, but then uh, the conveniences of this world often. Um, uh, make it difficult to live up to those noble ambitions and 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 things, and that that wasn't untrue of the people in the time of the prophet. So I wanted to briefly share that. That was a side note. Uh, so coming back to this story, um, what then happens is that on the other end, what the prophet did was he told everyone in this community not to speak with these three individuals. They weren't to respond to their salams. They weren't to greet them. They weren't to talk to them. They've in a sense become exiled. So this is the story of the uh, part on exile. Um, so here what we have is that, um, he says, as for us, we loved all Muslims as usual, but they were the ones who had turned away from us. 
Now we were in a condition that we would go to people, but they would not talk to us, nor greet us, uh, nor respond to our greetings. What a time that was, when the small world around us had ch changed totally. Uh, it seemed as if the people who used to be there are not there anymore. Nor our fruit farms, nor our homes, none of these were what they used to be. Everything looked strange. I became seriously worried about myself. If I die in this state of mind, I thought the Prophet would not say the Salah of Janazah, the funeral prayer for me. Or if the Prophet were to breathe his last during this period, I should be running around just like this all my life, condemned and disgraced before the community, before everyone. For this reason, as far as I was concerned, the whole earth started to feel desolate and indifferent. So he says, we lived like this for 50 nights, him and the two others. Um, because essentially the Prophet had turned this matter over to God. Um, so they were sort of in this waiting period, suspension period, where they're exiled from the community. So he says, at that time, the two companions of mine, Murara and Hilal, lost heart. They sat home and wept. But I was younger. I was younger than them. I went out, I walked around, I made my salah in the masjid with other Muslims and roamed in the bazaars, but nobody would talk to me nor respond to my salam, my greetings. He says, I used to attend the customary sitting of the Prophet وسلم, meaning when the Prophet would sit with the people after the prayer was over. When I said my salam to him, I tried to figure out whether or not his blessed lips would move to respond to my salam. So again, you know, this painting of this picture of love that's between the people that are present and have been impacted by the Prophet, he's really honing in. Did he, did he say salam or not? It says, then I tried to offer my salah just about close to him from where I would steal a glance towards him and discover that he looks at me when I get busy with my prayer. And when I look towards him, then he turns his face away from me. Um, I thought this was just, you know, really cute in a way where, you know, cute may not be the best <laughs> word, but um, it's beautiful. You know, the love that's being shared here and expressed here and the way this person that's been impacted by the Prophet's uh, legacy uh, is so concerned about how the Prophet will respond to him and receive him. Um, and is trying to find some solace in the fact that, oh, he's, he's looking at me when I'm not looking at him. Um, he says, essentially, this indifference drags longer and he eventually goes to his cousin that he knows very well, Abu Qatada, who is one of my dearest friends. He says, I jumped a wall to enter my his farm and I said salam to him. By God, he too did not respond to my salam. He's like, even him? Even my best friend, he asked, I said, I asked, oh Abu Qatada, don't you know that I love God and his messenger? Even then Abu Qatada observed silence. He didn't respond and he said, when I repeated my question three or four times, he finally said, God and his messenger know best. I broke down into tears and came out of the farm, jumping over the compound wall as I had done earlier. So he's now finally reached the state of his companions, you know. He's not losing hope in this state of indifference. And it's it's just kind of, um, it's kind of funny the way he describes how it took him a bit longer to get to this point that, oh man, I've, I've really screwed up. <laughs> I've really messed up here. Um, uh, let me uh, come to a close here with this story. I apologize for the length of time. I'm just kind of enjoying myself here. Um, the next instruction that comes from the Prophet, so they, they're in this um, situation of exile for 50 nights total. And the last uh, 10 nights, they're told that they're not uh, allowed to have intimate relationship uh, with their wives. Um, so th th this is just an added detail. But I want to now kind of skip to the point where now this verse is revealed that we read in the beginning of uh, this session that this that, that sort of... Um, freeze, uh, you know, these people, they kind of have this makeup period for their having no excuse of 50 days. Some people have said that it was 50 days because that was the, uh, the time of uh, the Battle of Tabuk. Um, don't quote me on that, but something around there. Um, and rereading the verse, eventually this verse is revealed to the Prophet ﷺ to sort of um, exonerate uh, these three. So it says, just as repetition, and God turned to the three who had remained behind until the earth became constricted for them, even though it was vast, and their souls were constricted, and they realized that there is no escape, there's no refuge from this issue 
um, from God except in him. There's no escape from God except in him. Then he turned towards them so that they may turn. Surely God is most oft turning, ever merciful. So just as a repetition. And the beauty of how essentially the prophet then meets him. This is the last part that I'll share with you all. It says, when I came out to present myself before the Prophet them, I saw that the Prophet was sitting there. There was a, a cordon of his Sahaba around him. When I said my salam to the Prophet, his blessed face was radiant with delight. He said, O oh Kaab, I congratulate you for this day of bliss for you, for this day of happiness, the best day of your life since you were born. I said, <clears throat> I said, so this is not Sayyidina Ka'ab, Ya Rasulullah, is this order of, you know, exoneration and forgiveness, is it from you or is it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He says, no, this order is from God. You had told the truth. So God made your truthfulness come out in the open, right? Um, after this, uh, the narration sort of ends with him asking the Prophet to give up all of his property um, and wealth in the way of God, and the Prophet refuses, then he says half of it, then the Prophet refuses, then he says a third of it, to which the Prophet gives him permission to do. Um, I want to now, inshallah, come back and tie this all back together for you. I hope, one, that this has sort of been a descriptive, uh, really putting flesh to what the process of Tawbah can look like for people, can look like for us in our own experiences. Um, but I also want to highlight what I highlighted in the beginning that Tawbah and true turning is a process of transformation. You know, it took time as it took, it takes time as it took time in this example. And it is also something that is mutually occurring between God and his creation in the sense that God turned to them, so they turned to him. And when God turns to you in mercy, it's almost as though there's no other choice. Um, you naturally turn. And this sense of mutuality and mutual turning, I think is also, I want to, is also pointing to something important. And that is that Tawbah, when there is this mutuality, when there, there's this real return and coming home to, 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 to be with God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be right with God after we've fallen short, um, it is an experience that makes us feel whole. It's holifying, if I could use that word. It is restorative. It puts us back together. Just as in this story, by the end of this process, he's ready to give up his wealth, you know, in this cause. He's ready. He has renewed energy. Um, he feels whole. So when this toba is accepted, it is a kind of coming home. It is a kind of reconnecting. It is a kind of God turning to us and us turning to him. So I just wanted to um, re sort of present this story uh, to you with the hope that you will have gained something from it by way of really fleshing out what Doba looked like in the time of the Prophet through the eyes of one of those companions. I know it was rather lengthy. Um, and I hope that we can find ways to really, you know, um, go beyond uh stuck places in our hearts, you know, places that maybe we don't allow to enter into that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we're too ashamed and really try to um, recognize that um, uh, God's mercy can encompass all of our shortcomings and transform them. And that, you know, that process can look very healthy, can look very restorative, can look very holifying. And it's not about just beating ourselves up, but it's about true transformation, true inner transformation. I hope that this hadith uh, brought that out. I hope that this verse and this reflection brought that out. I think we can conclude here um, with a beautiful dua that I was just reading um, earlier um, that's related in hadith that I think uh, uh, lifted me up. So I want to share it with you. Um, I'll do the Arabic and then inshallah we'll do the English. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma alif bayna kulubina wa aslih zata baynina wahdina subul as-salam wa najjina min al-dhulumati ila al-nur wa jannina al-fawahisha ma zahara minha wa ma batana wa barik lana fi asma'ina wa absarina wa kulubina wa azwajina wa dhuriyatina 
وتوب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وجعلنا شاكرين لنعمتك مثنين بها قابليها وأتمها علينا O oh Allah, bring our hearts together, alif bayna qulubina, reconcile between us, aslih dhata baynina, guide us to the ways of peace, wahdina subul salam and deliver us from darkness into light, wa najjina min al-dhulumati ila nur your light. Keep us away from immorality, the outward of it and the inward of it. Jannibna al-fawahisha ma dhahara minha wa ma batana, وَبَارِكْ لَنَا فِي أَسْمَاعِنَا And give blessings <clears throat> or bless us in our hearing, in our listening, um, and in our seeing, وَأَبْصَارِنَا In our seeing, in our sight, in our vision, put blessing in that, وَقُلُوبِنَا And in our hearts, وَأَزْوَاجِنَا And our spouses and our partners, وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا And uh, in our children, bless our children, Accept وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا And turn to us إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ تَوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ You are the oft-turning, the ever-merciful وَجَعَلْنَا شَاكِرِينَ And make us grateful, truly grateful لِنِعْمَتِكَ For your blessings مُثْنِينَ بِهَا Praising and accepting and acknowledging these blessings and these gifts in our lives مُثْنِينَ بِهَا قَابِلِيهَا وَأَتِمَّهَا عَلَيْنَا And give them to us in full and complete your blessings and favors for us. وَأَتِمَّهَا عَلَيْنَا Give them to us in full. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us uh, on this blessed Jum'ah. Um, whatever I have said uh, that is good is indeed from Allah. Any mistakes are of, of, of my own. I ask you, Ya Allah, to accept from us on this day. بِرَحْمَتِكَ يَا أَرْحَمَ الرَّحِمِينَ